<clears throat> well, thanks everybody. I really appreciate that. Um, welcome. So I understand you're all first year students contemplating uh, going to the Batten School, which means hopefully anyway, that you're contemplating a lifetime of public service career in uh, public policy, something along those lines. So what we're going to talk about today is sort of the, the niche or piece of public policy that I've been working in for the last 35 or 40 years, national security. And what we're going to do is, so when we think about sort of international conflict, policy analysts that work on international conflict are usually trying to figure out, is some crisis going to escalate into a war? If there's a war, who's going to be involved? If there's a bunch of countries involved in a war, how long is it going to last? How costly is it going to be? And so what we're going to do today is essentially distill down probably 25 years of research, uh, three years of your training into 45 minutes. Now, we're going to go really fast. We're going to talk a lot about history, uh, a lot of political science, a lot of policy analysis. If you have a question where I'm speaking too quickly, just Blurt out your question. You don't even have to raise your hand. Um, my hearing's not that bad. I'll catch it. So what we're going to do is, though, we're going to go through how policy analysts think about all these different things by way of looking at the case of the Russo-Ukrainian war, the war that's going on right now. And the reason I picked this is, hopefully, so if I did, if I talked about, say, the Crimean war, most of you would say, oh, fascinating. Who, what's, where's Crimea? Or if we talked about the Korean War, you would say, hey, my father told me about a great book about that. It was called The Forgotten War. I forgot. So we're going to talk about something hopefully you know a little bit about so that some of this will make sense. All right, let's get going. All right, so the area that Ukraine is in is referred to by historians and people that study, sort of ethnographers, that study that part of the world as the borderlands. And the reason is, in Ukraine, actually, there's a lot of great things about Ukraine. From my perspective, from a national security, from a military perspective, there's a lot of things that are really unfortunate about Ukraine. Now, if you're Ukrainian, if you're American, most of us don't get to pick where our country is. It just happens, I mean, it is what it is. Now, so on, this is a map of, this is Eastern Europe, this is Italy, the Mediterranean, up there is the Baltic Sea, we're going to come back to that in a little bit. Western Europe, now these brown areas, those are mountains. So like this big, huge ridge right here that cuts across a bunch of different countries, those are the Carpathian Mountains. Now, you'll notice Ukraine has no brown. Ukraine is all this sort of blah green. Well, on this terrain map, that blah green means it's flat. So the borderlands is actually not just Ukraine. It's Ukraine, Belarus, Poland, this part of Eastern Germany, formerly known as East Germany. This whole swath of Europe is really flat. Now, you're like, so who cares? It's flat. Like, Michigan is flat. Kansas is flat. Interestingly, in the United States, because we're just one country, we look at parts of our North America that are flat, and we're like, yeah, it's flyover country. Or... It's flat, so it's, the roads are straight. You can drive through it more quickly. Here in Europe, it's a bunch of different countries. For the past plus or minus 200 years, for the past 1,000 years, the borderlands have been fought over continuously. And the reason is, is because it's easy to drive back and forth across it. Before there were tanks, there were motor cars. Before there were motor cars, there were horse-drawn carriages. Before that, there were people on foot. It doesn't matter how you move around. The borderlands, particularly during the summer, are super easy to move around. Super easy to move around means really hard to defend. Really easy to move around means no natural borders. So in the United States, Michigan, Kansas, Nebraska, which would be easy to fight over or would have been fought over, we have the Rocky Mountains on one side of them, we have the Appalachian Mountains on the other side, and we have our essentially big coastlines filled with enormous cities that protect what would be our borderlands. Well, in Eastern Europe, there's no protecting this. So the Russians have fought over it, the Germans have fought over it, the Austrians have fought over it, the Poles, the Ukrainians. For 
thousand years, people have been going back and forth fighting over this part of the world. All right, so when we think about now going back from stepping back to the more abstract, when we think about policy analysis for a conflict, we want to think about what are the things that are the causes of it. And so we're going to talk at some length about that. Then we also want to think about forecasting the prospects of, like, say these two countries actually go to war. What's it going to look like? Is it going to be short? Is it going to be long? Are a bunch of people going to die? Are very few people going to die? Is it going to lead to the wholesale destruction of lots of equipment? What's the nature of that actual war going to be like? And the reason why we're really interested in that is decision makers, when they choose to attack their neighbors or not, predicate that choice to a significant extent on their expectations of what they think the war will be like. And so we're trying to essentially get inside the head of these decision makers who are trying to anticipate what the future is going to be like. Then we'll talk about the effects, and if we have any time left over, we'll discuss it. All right, so fast forward. This line here, jaggedy line that's purple and red, that's the border of Ukraine. Now, this is dated February 21st, February 22nd, two days before this war starts in earnest. Now, the red lines outside of Kharkov, Sumy, and just north of Kiev or Kiev, these are Russian troop concentrations on the border of Ukraine. Now, you might notice there's this area, the Donetsk, this is a coal basin, the big industry here is coal mining. Um, this red line, this is an area that was occupied by Russia, but legally is still part of Ukraine. Same goes true for this peninsula down here. That's the Crimea. The Crimean, it's of note because uh, there's a, an important bridge here that the Ukrainians just bombed a couple of weeks ago. You can talk about that if you want. But this is also Ukrainian land that is occupied by Russia before the war begins. All right, now, fast forward three weeks. The areas of red are areas that the Russian army is now occupying. Not now like today, but now fast forward three weeks. Okay, so you can see now Ukraine's huge. Ukraine's bigger than Texas. So like if you've ever driven across Texas or driven north south across California or driven from Massachusetts to Georgia, that give you a sense of the size of Ukraine. It's big. So these areas in red, that's big. You know, I mean, <clears throat> like this area right here, that's like the size of Iowa. Okay. These are big swaths of land. And so the, the Russians, in the space of three weeks, have moved to occupy a ton of Ukrainian territory. Now, this was yesterday. As you can see, the Ukrainians have now taken back a lot of the territory that the, the Russians had occupied. This blue area, this is an area that the Ukrainians, as, like, sort of as we speak, are in the midst of consolidating their control over this area. Same thing down here. This area was slashed. Blue area is a part of Russian-occupied control that has a lot of sort of insurgent or partisan activity. There's a lot of uh, what the Russians refer to as terrorist attacks, what uh, the Ukrainians would refer to as freedom fighter attacks. All right, now, let's talk about causes. How did this whole thing get started? Because as we're going to see, this war that's been going on now for since February till now, so eight months, it is the most costly war in Europe since the end of World War II. More Russian soldiers, we think, we don't know for sure, but we think have died in eight months than Americans have died in every war that the Americans fought in since 1948. Since 1948, 66,000 Americans have died in various wars, the Vietnam War, the Iraq War, the Afghanistan War, Put them all together, it's about 66,000. That's 60 years. And it's not like the United States hasn't been busy fighting with people all over the world in the last 60 years. In eight months, the Russians have lost more soldiers than that. This war is crazy intense. Like, way more intense than anything that any of us have been sort of around. And so it's very hard for us to get sort of a sense of perspective on this. Now, Policy analysis advice. If you're an academic political scientist, you get famous by coming up with one thing that lets you explain stuff. 
Weirdly, that's not how the world works. So what we have this distinction between people that do foreign policy analysis, and they tend to want to focus on complexity. Social scientists as academics tend to be rewarded for myopia or narrow focus. My advice to you is do not look at the world as a narrowly focused person. Don't be a hedgehog. Don't like ball up and think about one thing. Be a fox, dart around. Think about lots of different possibility, different possibilities of causes, different levels of analysis, all right? Now, we're gonna start off with, we're gonna talk about sort of like, what are the baseline underlying causes, the things that, to put it into the, um, I have three sons, they're 30, 25, and 17, so occasionally I devolve into 17-year-old speak, so pardon me if I do. So when we think about underlying causes and grievances, these are the things that piss people off, all right, that have gotten people really, really angry, individually, but more importantly, collectively. Now, another set of underlying causes, and this is a human thing that goes back literally as long as human beings have been human beings, is greed. Nothing's changed here. So for me, one of the things people are like, why do you study such horrible stuff? Well, one of the reasons why I study such horrible stuff, people killing people for grievances or greed, is because it's been part of the human condition for 10,000 years, and we still don't totally understand it. And so for me, that's just fascinating. It's like, wait a minute. We've been, people have been killing each other for tens of thousands of years, and we still haven't totally figured it out? Either that means there's something deeply flawed about human beings, or it's really complicated, or both. I think it's a little bit of both. All right, the second thing we're going to talk about are proximate causes. And here's where we can start to think about cures. Here's the things that we can think about to conflict resolution. This is sort of like the next layer. Now, wars tend to be very costly. Material stuff gets destroyed. People's homes are wrecked. People get killed super costly. If you could cut a deal and avoid the cost, why wouldn't you? So if you think about it, like if you knew you were going to lose, we'd have to come up with some pretty good stories about why you would want to fight. Alternatively, if you think you're going to win and you think you're going to win, it's going to be very hard to cut a deal because you both think, hey, wait a minute, if I win, I'm going to either alleviate my grievances or satisfy my greed, or both. But if you both think you're going to get what you want, it's going to be very hard for either one of you to make a concession. So we're going to talk a little bit about that. Then, <clears throat> the last thing that happens is, so we have these underlying conditions. So like grievances can fester for literally generations. And one of the things we're going to talk about, particularly in the Ukrainian case, is the problem of intergenerational grievances. Because they're there, they're real, and if, is there anybody here that's Ukrainian? If you were Ukrainian, once you knew about these grievances, you'd be pissed off too. Now, the flip side is, the sort of less historical, uh, the immediate stuff, like yesterday. Why did, when we think about, there's people that are angry all the time, there's people that are greedy all the time. Like I said, it's part of the human condition. But greedy people don't attack their neighbors every day. Why not? Well, one reason is they're deterred. One way of deterrence is they're afraid of getting arrested. In some instances, they're afraid, well, maybe my neighbor has a gun, and if I break into his house, he might shoot me. So I'm deterred from sort of following, following up on my greedy tendencies with my neighbor. If we see the war, that means deterrence failed. So if people are aware that these problems of greed and grievance exist, and they know that there are problems that could make it very difficult to cut a deal, to bargain, to create a peaceful bargain solution, the absence of fighting usually means one side or the other is being deterred by somebody. When the fighting starts, that means deterrence broke down. And so we're gonna talk about each of these different things, these sort of different levels of policy. Now, academics, to get famous as an academic, you basically write a paper about grievance. Or you write, a, like I've written several papers about information problems. Um, I've written, worked for the Defense Department on coming up with tools to understand deterrence failures. But to really understand the big picture, to understand the whole package, you gotta look at all the different sort of aspects here. 
So let's look at the grievances, and we'll start with Ukraine. So, and we're not going to go back a thousand years because we, we don't have limited time here. So in the 1930s, the Russians liquidate, there's actually Ukrainians at the behest of the Russians, they liquidate the entire Ukrainian Orthodox Church. Kill the priests, burn the churches to the ground, pisses people off because they're pretty, at the time in particular, very devout people. Now, from 1932 to 1933, under the Soviet Union's leadership of Joseph Stalin, the Russians impose a deliberate famine on Ukraine and the Ukrainians. The name for this, and it's not very well known, it's referred to as the Holodomor. It's essentially the food-based Ukrainian holocaust. Almost 4 million people are starved to death over the space of 14 months. How would they do that? The Russians take all the food away, they kill all the Ukrainian livestock, and then they burn all the fields. They get neighbors to inform on other neighbors who aren't starving, and then they go and take away those food. Millions of people die of starvation. and tell you, Starving to death is a terrible way to die. Now, You'll hear today, Vladimir Putin, President Putin, he'll talk about, well, look, there's parts of Ukraine that are really Russian, and how do we know that, President Putin? Well, because there are Russian-speaking people there that identify as Russian, not as Ukrainian. That is a true fact. President Putin is not lying. But the question is, how did those Russians come to have that land that happens to be in what the Ukrainians think of as Ukraine? Well, it turns out, after... These millions of people starved to death. The private landowners, they were referred to derisively as, by the Russians as kulaks. They took the land from the now dead kulaks and gave it to Russians. So the Russian-speaking people in these areas of eastern Ukraine that are Russian, let's just say they didn't come across that land under the best of circumstances. Then World War II happens. Holocaust, that everybody knows about, happens. A million Ukrainian Jews are put to death. Close to another million Ukrainians are relocated to put in slave labor camps in Germany. Now, this is interesting because the Ukrainians, for a brief period, hated the Russians more than they hated the Germans. And then the Germans treated the Ukrainians as bad or worse than the Soviet Russians had, and so they ended up hating both of them. But there's this period where the Ukrainians, because they hate, hated the Soviets so much because of the Holodomor, they open, the, the Germans arrive, and they thought they were going to welcome them. And so they're like, hello, Germans, come, come, help us out. Well, again, Vladimir Putin said, see, there are all these Ukrainians that are Nazis because they were friendly to the Germans in World War II. Well, by the end of World War II, the Ukrainians hate everybody. Now, you might say, ancient history. Well, in the 40s and 50s, so the Soviets are occupying Ukraine, the Ukrainians are like, we want to get rid of these guys. So there's an insurgency. The Soviets put down the Ukrainian insurgency in the most brutal counterinsurgency campaign conducted. And they do it principally through a terror campaign where they would say, not like the Germans do in World War II, where they say they would get a village mayor and they'd say, look, you need to tell me who all the insurgents are in this village or I'm going to kill all the people in your family. Soviets are like, that's way too nice. What we're going to do is watch. They don't ask him anything. They just say, watch. And then they randomly picked a village, and they killed everybody in the village. Literally everyone. Then they go back, and they say, so, do you have anything you want to tell me? That's all right. It's not an interrogation. And then they would go kill everyone in another random village. And then they would come back to you and say, how's it going? Anything you care to share to me? So now, you, now this is incredibly sadistically clever. Because now he's freaked out. I've now killed several thousand people, random, literally randomly. He then sees this and says, I've got to put a stop to this. He starts to talk to me. The people in his village say he's a collaborator, and they kill him unless he gives the information about the insurgents fast, faster. This counterinsurgency campaign is the most brutal, sadistic, clever campaign against the Ukrainians that pits Ukrainians against Ukrainians through the literally random use of violence. It works. Now, fast forward. You're like, so what? It's 50s. None of us were born yet. True. 
1994, the Ukrainians, Cold War's over, Soviet Union's collapsed. Ukraine had been where the Soviets kept essentially a third of their nuclear missile forces. The Ukrainians say to the Americans, hey, how about this? We'll give you the Soviet nuclear weapons. Now, a lot of Ukrainian engineers had worked in these programs, a lot of nuclear expertise in a variety of different things we can talk about at length if you want to. <coughs> George Bush, the elder, says, oh, that would be so great. If you gave up the nuclear weapons, we'll provide a security guarantee for you. Ukrainians give up the nuclear weapons. George Bush and all Americans after him have their fingers crossed behind their backs, having no intention of providing a security guarantee to the Ukrainians. Ukrainians are pissed off. 2013, fast forward. Now everybody in the room is alive. So we're up to current history, pretty much. It was only eight years ago. The Russians annex Crimea. Crimea is that peninsula I talked about. This sort of big, very pretty, coastal. The Russians have a reason to want it. We'll talk about that in a minute or so. Now, the Russians, why are they pissed off? Russians are, well, I get in trouble because I make, you know, sweeping generalizations. I'll try to keep those to a minimum. All right, now, so end of the Cold War, Soviet Union collapses. The West, led by the United States, take advantage of this and expand NATO, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, sort of the Western defensive alliance for Western Europe and the United States and Canada. Well, this pisses off Russia a lot. Now, John Mearsheimer, an esteemed colleague of mine at the University of Chicago, has a YouTube video. You look it up, John Mearsheimer, NATO expansion. I think it's been viewed 25 million times. Uh, and John, he's a brilliant scholar, but he is a hedgehog. All right? And John's ex explanation of everything is all driven by NATO expansion. Everything that we've talked about, pff, doesn't matter. NATO expansion. And he's got a good point. NATO expansion matters. It really, really, really pissed off the Soviets and the Russians. But it's not all there is. They're actually pissed off by even more than that. Now, in the 2000s, Soviet Union's over. Everybody's like, well, you know what? Soviet Union, that was a great power, but you're not the Soviet Union anymore. So pound sand. In the 2010s, we start to hear a lot of rhetoric coming out of Moscow. Hey, whoa, 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 with this Ukrainian identity stuff, this like Ukrainians thinking they're a thing? That's not real. They're all Russians. It's fake. Don't believe that. And the Ukrainians and Americans and Western Europeans are like, no, actually, they look like Ukrainians. They actually have a language. I think the Ukrainians are a people. That really pissed off. They're like, no, he's fake. Americans are like, no, I have, they live in Chicago, and they told me they're actually Ukrainian. They seem like very nice people. They have really good kielbasa. I think them, they're like the Poles, but shorter. I think, like, you know, they're Ukrainian. The Russians are angrier and angrier. 2014, having annexed Crimea. Now, Crimea, from a geographic perspective, geography, land, physical, turns out it's very dry. Like, really dry. Like, so dry. It's basically like, imagine the Central Valley of California without any snow melt. Super deserty. But it's incredibly productive agricultural land. Why? Well, because remember when we looked at that, the, the map of the borderlands, remember there's all pretty flat and there's a lot of rivers going around. Well, the Ukrainians and the Soviets had dammed up a bunch of those rivers and created a canal to provide irrigation water for the entire Crimean Peninsula. So the Ukrainians being aggrieved when the Soviets annexed Crimea said, all right, we got something for you. We're going to dam the irrigation canal and shut off all the water to Crimea. Go pound sand, Russians. So the Russians are pissed off about that. All right, what about greed? Now, <coughs> both sides want more. Both sides are greedy. Pretty much a universal in situations of conflict. <coughs> Excuse me. Now, one of the things I want to look at as we go through the Russian points of greed, notice that many of the things that Russia wants come at the expense of other people. Many of the things that the Ukrainians want, if they have it, it doesn't really hurt anybody else. So that's an interesting thing to focus on. Now, the Russians, coming out of their grievance, they want more status. Typically, status is part of a hierarchy. Our psychologist friends can talk a lot about status hierarchies, but 
they may not be zero sum, but they're clearly relative. My status is relative. You know, so if I'm a hermit that lives alone in the woods, uh, not particularly status conscious. Status conscious people, either individually or collectively, are thinking about their position relative to somebody else. Okay, so it's all in the context of some of other people. Now, President Putin, he also he's thinking personally about status, not so much about the Russian people. That's an issue for him as well. But he's also thinking about his status relative to Brezhnev, Ukraine, uh, Brezhnev, Khrushchev, Yeltsin, all the way back to Stalin, Lenin, the czars, all the way back to Peter the Great. So he's thinking about his status in the context of individual Russian leaders. Now, they want, the Russians want land. They want that Donbass region. Uh, there's a lot of Russian-speaking people there. They want the Crimea. The reason why they want Crimea is because it's the only really warm water port they have for the entire Russian Navy. Uh, and it's a pretty sweet, beachy kind of place. Um, and they want this area just at the southern part of the Carpathian Mountains called Transnistria. They want to sort of glom that onto Russia. Uh, there's a lot of oil and gas in this region. Oil and gas are two big exports for the Russians. They're good at that. They're good at exporting it. Um, they want to turn Ukraine, this is before the war, into something called Finland. We'll talk more about that if you have questions. Finland is sort of a, was, no longer a neutral country. And they'd like Ukrainian to be essentially a puppet. And they had this in 2014, briefly. Now, what do the Ukrainians want? Now, no notably, these gains are mostly absolute. They want to kind of be European, you know? They want to have nice cars, nice clothes, nice food, uh, nice stuff for their kids. They want to have European democracy. They want to be able to pick their leaders and have, you know, Ukraine is one of the more corrupt countries on the planet. They would like it to be more like European EU style democracy where corruption is kept in place by a pretty efficient bureaucracy and where politicians have less control. But the biggie, the big thing that Ukraine wants is autonomy. They want to be independent. They don't want people telling them what to do. Now, the Ukrainians see autonomy as it's an absolute game. My being relatively independent doesn't hurt Russia. The Russians disagree. They see Ukrainian autonomy, security from Russian coercion, security from Russian influence. They see this autonomy, the Russians, see Ukrainian autonomy as hugely threatening. Why? Russia is a land empire of lots of different peoples, plural, that speak different languages. If the Ukrainians can do whatever the Ukrainians want, the Tartars, the Uzbeks, these people throughout the Russian empire, they might also want to be their own thing too. So for the Russians, Ukrainian autonomy is terrifying. All right, now let's get to, those are the underlying things. Now, there is sort of from this bargaining perspective, <coughs> three causes. You might say, well, how do you know there's just three? There's a mathematical proof of this. This comes out of some game theory work that was done starting in the late 80s and the early 90s. Um, we're not, we don't need to go into the details. It's not important. But basically, we think there's three big sort of constraints, if people are rational, on our ability to bargain well. The first one is you can't bargain over stuff easily if you can't divide it up. So like you'll have to take a class on bargaining. Our, again, our psychology professors talk about bargaining all the time, and they'll use analogies like uh, divide a dollar. Well, yeah, you can divide a dollar in you know, two 50-cent pieces, four quarters, 10 dimes, whatever. That's the beauty of money. You can divide it up. Uh, they'll talk about pies. Well, like when you're a kid, all right, uh, you cut, I choose. That means you cut the pie in half, and I get to pick the, you know, you're like, oh, well, is it exactly half? I want the bigger half. But the pie, we're going to divide the pie. Some things tough to divide. In divorce, children notoriously difficult to cut in half without creating problems for them. <laughs> Truly, it's a problem. Uh, and it's one of the reasons why divorces tend to be so problematic. Um, Jerusalem, Temple Mount slash Wailing Wall. Very tough to divide when you have a physical location that is seen as emotional religious ground zero for a global religion that has expansion aspirations as both you know, sort of Christianity 
Islam and Judaism all do. They all believe like that one spot is their sacred spot. Tough to divide, tough to negotiate over that. Now, second big problem is, say we can agree to a deal, but one or both sides can't commit to actually honoring the terms of the deal. So like I say, all right, all right, all right. Um, <clears throat> we'll take the pie, you get half, I get half. And then you cut it in half, and then I just take both halves. Say, ha, ah, now I have two pieces of pie. Go pound sand. Um, you're like, but wait a minute. The deal was I was going to have half, and you were going to have half. I'm like, yeah, what are you going to do? Cry to mom? What are you going to do? Cry to dad? Ha, ah, I got both pieces of pie. Go suck an egg. Unless there's a way to commit to the bargain, to enforce that deal, if people believe the deal is unenforceable, you're not going to get a deal. Now, third thing, we talked a little bit about this at the very beginning, is disagreement about what the nature of war, if it actually took place, was actually going to be like. So if we both think we're going to win, that means we both think we should get the pie. If I think I'm stronger than you think I am, I'm going to want to demand a bigger piece of the pie than you're going to be prepared to give me. So if we disagree about who's going to win or lose, if we disagree about how long it's going to last, if we disagree about how costly it's going to be, all of these things make it very hard to cut a deal. All right, so let's look at some of the things that caused bargaining failure between Ukraine and Russia. <coughs> now, the Ukrainians in November of last year, December, January, February, leading up to February of this year, before the war, the Ukrainians actually know they're stronger, their military, their army is stronger than it literally everybody else in the world thinks it is. Other than a few handfuls of American Special Forces troops that have been in Ukraine for the last few years training Ukrainian soldiers on how to fight with advanced Western weapon systems. Turns out, American arms, javelin missiles, stingle missiles, a bunch of other stuff, super effective. More importantly, our training has been very effective. American Western NATO training is focused on training individuals in a set of SOPs, standard operating procedures, but also how to think through in a systematic but weirdly independent way to take the initiative. So you're in a bad situation. Things are going down, like you're standing there, and all of a sudden your captain's head just got blown off. You're the lieutenant. Now you're in charge. What do you do? Well, in the Western military way of thinking, you, the lieutenant, you're not the captain. You're in charge. Figure it out. Go do what you think is going to be best. The Russians, they don't train their troops that way. The Russian system, and this goes back a long, like 100 years plus, is very top down. Taking the initiative is totally frowned on. So the Ukrainians actually figured that out, and they've been targeting Russian generals, colonels, and majors, which then, once those higher level people are removed from the battlefield, the lower level people tend to either run away or stand around and wait for somebody to come tell them what to do. Whereas the Americans have been training the Ukrainians, hey look, this is your country, this is your place, contrary to what the Russians say, you're actually Ukrainian people, and here's how we fight, and each of you needs to understand that you'll, you may be in charge. And so it's a very different, totally different mindset. Now, importantly, Zelensky, the president of Ukraine, also knows, he knows that he's not going to run away. Now, when the United States leaves Afghanistan, one of the reasons why we left Afghanistan, or related to that, was the president of Afghanistan, that dude just ran away. Like, here comes the Taliban, and before the Taliban even get to the outskirts of Kabul, the president of Afghanistan is first in Pakistan, then in Dubai, partying down, along with a ton of money that he took from Afghanistan. Well, lots of people, including the Americans, including President Biden, thought that Zelensky was going to run away, just like the Afghan president did. The Russians, Vladimir Putin, believes that the president of Ukraine is just going to run away. Zelensky knows that he's not going to. Well, that makes it hard to cut a deal. Now, the Russians, now, the Ukrainians know they're stronger than the Russians and everybody else think. The Russians think they're stronger, but they're not. Okay, turns out the Russians, as we now know, I uh, wouldn't say they're a paper tiger. I mean, they've killed a lot of people. They've destroyed huge swaths of an entire country. So it's not like they're weak, but their system of fighting doesn't match up well with the Ukrainian system of fighting that we've trained them in. Now, 
how did we make this mistake? How did the Russians make this mistake? Well, we look at places where, like in Georgia and Syria, not Georgia, the United States, but Georgia, the country, where the Russians were fighting people that didn't have this. The Russians fight people that are relative, that fight like Russians with equipment that's Russian equipment or old Russian equipment, and the Russians kick their butt. So the Russians are like, we are bad, they are weak. Ukrainians are like Syrians, they are weak, we are bad, that we kill them all. No, it didn't work out that way. Now, so the Russians underestimate the Ukrainians. Tough to cut a deal. Now, remember we said indivisibility, you can't divide it. Well, Zelensky knows this. Zelensky doesn't want to cut a deal because he knows the deal that's being offered, the bargain, is giving up a big chunk of Ukraine. And signing a paper that would say Ukraine will essentially give up on aspirations of being a normal European democracy, being part of the normal European security community, all of that. So Zelensky tells the Ukrainian people it's impossible. We can't, we can't make these divisions. We can't cut these deals. This is indivisible. Ukrainian sovereignty, Ukrainian identity is indivisible. Now, is that true? Eh, not really. But he makes the claim, and politically, it actually works out that way. Now, commitment. So the Russians, before the war starts off, say, let's negotiate. Let's bargain. We'll cut your deal. Well, who's going to believe the Russians? The Russians violated all the Helsinki Accords from the 1970s about the peaceful the nonviolent resolution of disputes between nations. The Russians were one of the original signatures to that agreement, and then they went and attacked all their neighbors. The INF is the Intermediate Range Nuclear Weapons Treaty. The Russians violated that treaty routinely. So the Ukrainians look at all these treaty violations and like, why on earth would we ever sign a deal with you to create a bargain that you would never live up to? Last part, deterrence. You got 10 minutes, right? Let's go to 450. Wow, coming a lot. You have no idea how much like, theoretical and empirical ground we're covering here. It's crazy. All right, so if I want to deter you from attacking me, one, I have to have the capacity to do it. I have to be able to tell you, hey, if you attack me, I will be able to successfully fight you off. Or if you attack your neighbor, I will help your neighbor kick your ass. That's deterrence in a technical way. Now, so I have to have the physical capability to do it. The claim that I make that I will either kick your ass or help them kick your ass, that claim has to be credible also. You have to believe me. If you don't believe me, then deterrence fails. I have to be resolved. So I may have the physical capacity. I may be able to actually do it if I want to do it, but I may in the end not have the resolve. So the United States and other countries, as we'll see in a minute, They've done things that have indicated they're not particularly resolved about deterring violence by other parties. <coughs> and you have to have the ability to let other people know, send these signals to other people, that you actually have these capacities. All right, so let's see what we got here on deterrence. What are the signals? The United States and NATO? Deterrence, for it to work, requires strength and the ability to convey that strength credibly. Why? Because basically you're saying, if you do something I don't want you to do, I will make you pay. So you've got to be strong. You have to be resolved. In the previous two decades, the United States and NATO had signaled weakness. Not strength, not resolve. The Russians have been signaling they're super pissed off, and that they believe they're really, really strong. So, start is the Strategic Arms Reduction Talks. This was a set of agreements between the United States and originally the Soviet Union, then the United States and Russia, to eliminate many, not all, but many of our strategic nuclear weapons. Now, the United States says, hey, getting rid of strategic nuclear weapons is good. Let's get rid of uh, tactical nuclear weapons, the smaller ones, also. And we do. The Russians are like, wait, we agree, get rid of big ones. You say nothing about small ones, we keep all our small ones. So the Russians have thousands upon thousands of tactical nuclear weapons. We have a few hundred. They're like, 
Americans, crazy and weak. Now, NATO, starting in the mid-1990s, disarms. So the Ukrainians have, dis have disabled, captured, or destroyed about 1,600 Russian tanks so far in the last few months. In 1994, Germany had 2,000 tanks. Great Britain had 1,800 tanks. Today, Germany has 160 tanks. Great Britain has 200 tanks. The United States used to have 2,800 tanks in Germany. Today, we have zero. NATO eliminated 90% of its combatant force in Europe because we thought, it was a reasonable thought, it wasn't crazy, it wasn't stupid, Cold War's over, arms are made for hogging now. Why do we need all these arms? Let's take the peace dividend and spend it on our people. So, the United States is way, way, way richer than Russia is today. And in part because we spend a lot of our money on our people instead of buying weapons. But the Russians take this as a sign of weakness. Germany closes all but three of its nuclear power plants. Why? Well, because the Green Party didn't want them because they think that nuclear power is evil. Um, and the chancellor of Germany wanted the Green Party in her coalition so that she could remain prime minister longer than any other German prime minister in the 20th century. Germans switch to Russian gas. Again, the green, the German, turns out Germany is sitting on 50 trillion BTUs of natural gas. But fracking to get at that natural gas in Germany is illegal. So the Germans spend five times what it would cost to extract their own natural gas to pay the Russians to ship natural gas from Siberia to Germany in order to keep together the coalition with the Green Party. Now, this gives the Russians a ton of German money. What do they do? Germans buy, I mean, the Russians buy weapons to it. Now, the United States, we abandon Afghanistan. So the Russians look at that, they're like, oh, they abandoned Afghanistan, they'll abandon the Ukrainians too. Say we're not going to send any troops there, we'll skip through that. Now, Russians complain about NATO expansion. We talked about that. They complain that the collapse of the Soviet Union was the worst disaster in the history of mankind. They mobilized their troops. They're trying to send a signal to the Americans that, no, we're serious. We actually will attack Ukraine. Now, the problem is in the United States, you've got all my academic buddies. You've got these pundits writing in newspapers. You've got these think tank people saying, nah, the Russians never do it. The Russians are beside themselves by the time we get to December and January of 2022, trying to convince people, no, actually, we will invade. Nobody's believing them. It's actually kind of weird. President Biden then gives a speech where he says, no, really, the Russians are going to invade. And everybody's like, nah, they won't do it. Come on, you're just kidding everybody. Now, all of this stuff happens, we get war anyway. So what are the best comparison cases to think about? First one, Korean War. Why? Well, before the North Korean invasion, Truman administration states that Asian countries really aren't one of our interests. Kind of the way the United States talked about Ukraine. Then, North Korea invades, changes Truman's mind, and we get involved in the war. Same thing happens in Ukraine. We have super aggressive policies that get put in place because of the invasion of North Korea and South Korea. We're starting to see the same thing today. Now, weirdly, though, when the war ends, this is the only prediction I'm going to make, I don't think the borders of Ukraine and Russia are going to end up very different than they were in January of 2022. I think it's going to look very similar to that. But just like at the end of the Korean War, from a policy perspective, everything's different. Like everything. The world's different. Security world's different. Lots of change. And then the last effect, and, we'll be, and I'll finish up in this and take questions for just the last couple of minutes, is the second war to think about is the Crimean War. Middle 19th century, the Crimean Peninsula near the Dardanelles with Turkey. You're like, why? Who cares about that? Well, in the Crimean War, Prussia, what becomes Germany, they don't get involved. 
They sit it out. It's not like the German military didn't want to get involved. They did. But the Chancellor of Prussia says, no, we're going to sit this one out. We don't really have a stake in this one. It's not our fight. Well, today, that's basically what China and the United States are doing. We're sending a lot of weapons there, but we're not sending any troops. In the Crimean War, Russia, Turkey, Great Britain, France, all suffer huge losses, both in terms of material, lives, but most importantly to their economies. The Prussian economy, relative to all those other Western European states, Russia and Turkey, this is when Prussia really starts to take off because all these countries had wasted so much time, energy, and resources in an unnecessary war. Well, we're kind of seeing the same thing today. China is like, we're not getting involved in that. That'd be crazy. What are you, we're not going to do that. And that's basically what the United States is doing too. So we've gone through in 45 minutes, 43 minutes, we've talked about sort of a general framework. If you took a course from me on this, we'd actually spend, you could spend 10 years, a year, a semester, going through in detail how to understand how to actually do this, how to do this kind of analysis in a really systematic way for different kinds of countries, different kinds of conflicts. How do you weigh or balance the different... One of the things that for me, that again, that's fascinating about foreign policy and security policy analysis compared to, say, health policy analysis. In most areas of public policy, it's very easy to assign numbers to things, to quantify things, to measure things, to do experiments to understand what, what works and what doesn't. We can't do experiments with war. So all the data that we have is just observational data. They actually don't happen very often, so we don't have many cases. But when they do happen, they're incredibly destructive. And most of the things that these wars hinge on, the starts, the outcomes, the effects, they actually don't hinge on the material factors. They hinge on the belief systems of the people that are fighting in those wars. And for me, that's just super fascinating. I hope I've been able to convey some of my sort of interest, enthusiasm for why I do what I do, why I study what I worked on. Um, I hope that the Batten School, I, I wouldn't have come here and come to be the dean of the Batten School and work to support great faculty like Professor uh, Eileen and others if I didn't think this was an extraordinary place. It's an amazing school. Um, I encourage you all to continue your interest in uh, joining us at the school. Thanks very much. <laughs> Um, so 30 members of the sort of left wing of the Congressional Caucus, starting in June and then through July, put together a letter basically telling President Biden that they felt that he should force the Ukrainians to negotiate with the Russians to bring an end sooner rather than later to the war. Um, I think that objectively totally makes sense. I think they're actually right on the merits of it. The timing of it was brutal because what changed in before when they wrote the letter and when they distributed the letter was the Russians starting to target deliberately and solely civilians. And so the Russians changed how they were fighting the war from the time that they wrote the letter. When they wrote the letter, the war was basically Russian army, Ukrainian army. Today, the Ukrainian army has basically defeated the Russian army. And so the, what the Russian army is now doing is attacking Ukrainian civilians, which is bad form at best. Um, and so now all of a sudden you have these progressive people in Congress appearing to say, let's cut a deal with a war criminal where the political optics of it are horrendous for them. And Nancy Pelosi, when the timing is just unbelievable. So Pelosi was out of the country actually drumming up support for the war with our European allies when the letter hits the streets. And so I think it, I don't know, again, it's one of these things like we know who did it, what they did, but I cannot figure out why they did it, when they did it. It doesn't make, you know, politically it doesn't make any sense. Thanks very much.